Uh, welcome back to our regular guests. A special welcome to any uh, who are with us for the first time, and a particularly special welcome to you who made it around the full parking lot. Sorry about that. It does happen sometimes. Uh, first Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the university libraries, archives, and special collections. This year's theme is Roaring Good Tales, Animals in the Archives, and we have presentations today from the Immigration History Research Center Archives and the University of Minnesota Archives. And lunch today is from Gorka Palace. And then, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And there will be a tour after the program with Tim Johnson. Tim, there he is. Thank you, Tim. And before we move on to the rest of the program, we have a couple of short announcements, starting with Kirsten Clark about Friends of the Libraries. Come on up, Kirsten. It's really great to see everybody here. My name is Kirsten Clark. I'm on the Friends of the Library board. I also work here in the libraries. And so it's great, again, it's great to see you all here supporting this. There are other ways you can support the libraries as well. We have several friends groups, and many of them are actually tied to the series. You'll see some of those presentations throughout the, this year. Um, but I'll just kind of wanted to put out here those, those particular friends groups. We have the associates of the James Ford Bell. We have the Treader Collection, the Curlin Friends. Friends of the Anderson Horticultural Library, Friends of the Sherlock Holmes Collection, and then we have our larger Friends of the Libraries group. Um, and so there's some information at the back table, but I also have uh, asked, there's also a website on, that, on the handout as well. Um, that'll take you to the list of all the various events that we have, and many of them are free and available to the public, so thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. And then we have a quick announcement or a reminder that November 14th is Give to the Max Day. And if you love the university libraries and want to help support our programs, all of the University of Minnesota Give to the Max Day causes are on givingday.umn.edu website. And uh, if you didn't catch that, you can ask me afterwards and I'll, I'll give you that address. Great, right, so let's move on to the uh, presentations. Our first presentation today is Hmong Animal Centered Stories, presented by Ellen Engseth, curator of the Immigration History Research Center Archives and head of Migration and Social Services. There is a rich use of animals in Hmong traditional stories. Explore some of these available in the Immigration History Research Center Archives, especially a series produced for the Hmong Folk Tales Project in the 1980s to preserve Hmong oral traditions and to aid literacy here in the Twin Cities. Good afternoon. Thanks. So, yes, today I'd like to share with you some stories available in the Immigration History Research Center archives. They're also on display for you to my left. These booklets, which are most often referred to by us as the Hmong folktale books, include many stories that center on animals, and these stories are the focus of my talk today. So I was the one who suggested this year's First Fridays theme on animal-centered materials in our collections, and I did so for a few reasons. One, I thought it would be fun. And secondly, I've been following the scholarly and popular interest in animals and on the human animal experience. This interest has been named by many as the animal turn, a multi-species approach to scholarship where new understandings of human animal relationships are being explored. Its decentering of humans is affecting the field of history too, and animal history is now of interest to many. How do we locate sources on animals in the archives in order to explore this history? It can be difficult for a number of reasons, including lack of catalog and archival access points that clearly point to such sources. As noted in a description for a conference happening next week called Traces of the Animal Past, Methodological Challenges in Animal History at the Archives of Ontario, part of that of the challenge of historians is to actually find the animal in the archives. Finding animals in the past can be difficult. 
Their histories are mediated by the humans who inscribed the original records and who organized archival collections. And in oral histories, they note, the place of animals in the past is further refracted through the frailty of human memory and recollection. So I was very happy to take some time in the last few months in pre preparation for this talk to look for animals in the archives. And among quite a few sources, I kept coming back to one of my long favorite groups of material in the collection. These booklets, many of which include or indeed center on animals. And in some cases, they do depict animals interacting with humans. Also, they are not very well known or highly used among all the sources in our collection, so I'm really happy to draw some attention to them today. I acknowledge that I'm an outsider and a novice in regards to Hmong culture, as well as to some of the many subject and academic disciplines to which these sources might relate. I'm very much in a learning space regarding these stories. Rather than offering expert perspective or interpretation of these folk tales, it is my goal to share them and to encourage further exploration of them. I thank my colleague Esther Chan for her scanning assistance. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the expertise and language skills of my library colleague, Zhang Li, who was good enough to coach me on pronunciation and to narrate in Hmong a few lines of one story uh, for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Zhang. These folktale booklets were produced here in the Twin Cities. According to this book, Hmong Folktales, Exercises and Activities, uh, which dates from 1988, the Northwest Area Foundation and McAllister College supported the original nonprofit Hmong Folktales Project, which had the goals, as Linnea noted in the introduction, to preserve Hmong oral traditions and to aid literacy. In the Immigration History Research Center archives, we have many examples of these folk tales produced in the early 80s at level one, clearly used for English as a second language instruction, as well as a few in the more advanced level two. Happily, many local archives and libraries provide access to and preserve these booklets as well, including McAllister College Archives and Concordia University. Our copies came to us as part of the Refugee Studies Center records. This center, which began as the Southeast Asian Refugee Studies Project, existed at the U of M between 1980 and 1998. And according to Dr. Chia Wang, this center was an information clearinghouse for researchers, educators, students, policymakers, foundations, and health and human service providers. It was one of three refugee studies centers of this magnitude in the US, Canada, and England. It maintained its own reference and research library in order to fulfill this mission. <clears throat> and after the center closed, the contents of this library then came to us along with the administrative records. The 628 library books were individually cataloged by our colleagues and now fully discoverable as a set due to a tag prov provided in those catalog records. The Hmong folktale booklets are a subset of all these books. So let's read a few of these tales, those which feature or include animals. Many of the animal related tales relate to agriculture. The first farmer explains why we labor in agriculture in the harvesting of crops. So we're going to be patient and actually read these pages. I have to be patient. Um, and I have to put on my glasses. A Hmong, mm, a Hmong farmer wanted to plant corn. So he cut down trees. And he cut down weeds. He planted corn. And he went home. The corn grew. But the weeds grew again, too. The weeds hurt the little corn plants, and the corn cried. The corn plants went to the farmer's house. The weeds hurt us, they said. 
The farmers answered, tell the weeds to stop. They will have to stop or I'll hurt them and I will come in seven days. So the corn plants went back to the field. They waited for the farmer. They waited and waited. The first day a tiger came. The weeds asked, is that your owner? The corn said, oh no, our owner has a big hat. The second day a wildcat came to the field. The weeds asked, is that your owner? The corn said, no, our owner has a big hat and a pipe. The third day, a mouse came. Is that your owner? No, our owner has a big hat, a pipe, and a long knife. So the weeds grew and grew. They hurt the corn, and the corn cried. The fourth day, a cow came. The weeds asked, is that your owner? The corn said, no. The fifth day, a wolf came to the field. The corn said, that isn't our owner. The sixth day, a chicken came. The corn said, excuse me, that isn't our owner, but he'll come tomorrow. Then on the seventh day, the farmer came. He had a big hat, a pipe, and a long knife. He cut the weeds. The corn was happy. Oh, Mr. Farmer, you helped us so much. We'll help you too. We'll grow big and come to your house. Please get a place ready for us. So the farmer went home, but he went to sleep. Then the corn came to his house. The corn asked, said, what? You have no place ready for us? You're too lazy. We won't walk to your house anymore. You will have to carry us. Another project book, Six Hmong Folk Tales Retold in English, provides some contextual or interpretive notes for this tale. These authors, Charles and Ava Dale Johnson, while otherwise very helpful, do not provide explanation of this role of the six animals. To my novice eye, the animals provide placeholding rather than a key role, providing us characters through which I learn about the clothing and the implements of the farmer and building up some drama for that day when the farmer appears and the next stage of the story begins. The plants tell the farmer to return home and to prepare a storeroom for them, which of course he does not do. And the result is hard physical labor during harvest. Our Hmong Folk Tales Exercises and Activities book explains that this tale is, quote, a favorite with many students and teachers due to patterns of repetition. It is a why tale, not about how agriculture began, but why harvesting is hard. Another why tale is one of my favorites. Shao and his fire is explained in the exercise book as a portrayal of a seer, still known of in Hmong culture in present time, an ancient wizard type being who gave advice but did not intervene. Um, so after the title page, in which you can see the stamp of the library I was speaking of, um, and all of the contributors and acknowledgments, of course, we begin this story. Shao knew everything. He lived a long time ago. Shao spoke every language. He spoke with wild pig. He spoke with bear and tiger. These were his friends. They lived together. Every day, they talked together. One day, Dragon said, I need a house. You need a house. Every animal needs a house. We can't live together all the time. Tiger said, I like to live together, but I don't like to be quiet. I want to make noise, but I can't. My noise is very big. It will make you afraid. The friends said, oh, we aren't afraid of you. You can't make a very big noise. So Tiger said, wait and see. <clears throat> and he went up to the mountains. He went up high. He growled. He shook the earth. He opened his mouth, and he showed his teeth. Then he came down again. He asked, were you afraid? No, answered Dragon. I am the scary one. I will go up the mountain. I will make the sky black. I will throw down water everywhere the mountain sides will fall. 
So Dragon went up on the mountain. He made the sky black. He threw down water everywhere. The mountain sides fell, and the river was mud. Then Dragon came down again. He asked his friends, were you afraid? Oh, no, they answered. You did little things. We're not afraid of little things. Then Thunder spoke. He said, I will go make you afraid. I will go up above the mountains. I will make the sky black. I will break the trees. I will make noise in all the sky. I will make lightning jump across it. I will throw lightning in your eyes, and you will be afraid. So Thunder went up above the mountains, and he made the sky black. He broke the trees. He made noise in all the sky. He made lightning jump across it. And he threw lightning in his friend's eyes. Then he came down again. Were you afraid, he asked. No, the animals answered. We weren't afraid at all. Then Shao said, well, I can make you afraid. How, asked his friends. First, cut some grass. Second, cut some trees. Third, build a house. So the animals worked. They built a house. Then Shao said, go inside. Close all the walls. You won't have any windows. You won't have any doors. So the animals went inside the house. They closed all the walls. They didn't have any windows. They didn't have any doors. Shao was outside his, the house. Now, Shao said, you are all inside the house. You don't have any windows. You don't have any doors. Are you afraid? His friends answered, no. Then Shao struck his flint. It made a noise. Tss, tss, tss. Are you afraid? No, the friends said. We're not afraid of a little noise. Tss, tss, tss. Then Shao lit the straw and the wood. Are you afraid? He asked. No, they said. But then the friends heard fire. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Soon they saw fire. And th next they felt fire. It was hot. They all yelled, help, help. Thunder was very afraid and flew to the sky. Dragon hit dug into the ground and he hid under the house. Wild pig jumped out of the house, but the fire burned him a little and made him yellow. Tiger wanted to jump out, but he couldn't. So he jumped against the walls again and again. The fire made him striped. White bear couldn't jump out. The fire burned his face. It burned his arms. It burned his body. It burned his legs and feet. It made him black all over. The fire burned and burned. It was Shao's fire. It burned for seven years. Our, our next tale is Ya, the orphan. In preparing for this talk, I read that in Hmong folk tales, stories centered on orphans are common. The notes on this tale explain that not only is this an example of the orphan story, it also provides favorite elements such as the number seven, again, magic objects, and teaching the obedience of youth. So we have the title page and the acknowledgments of all the contributors. And it begins, a long time ago there was a king. He had seven daughters. He said, daughters, go find husbands. Take this horse, take this red-eyed dog. The first daughter said, no, I won't go. The second daughter said, no, I won't go. The third daughter said, no, I won't go. The fourth daughter said, no, I won't go. The fifth daughter said, no, I won't go. The sixth daughter said, no, I won't go. But the seventh daughter said, yes, father, I will go. Then the king said, follow the red-eyed dog. He will stop at a man's house. He will stay in that house. You marry that man. The seventh daughter took the horse. He, she took the red-eyed dog. She followed the dog. It went to Yah's house. Yah was an orphan. He had no mother or father. 
he was poor. The red-eyed dog went into Yah's house. He hid under the bed. He wanted to stay in Yah's house. The seventh daughter cried and cried, but she stayed in Yah's house, and she married him. Every day the king's daughter cried. Yah said, what can I do? My wife cries. She's not happy. So he said, I'll go to Shao. He's a wise man. He knows everything. He'll help me. So Yah went to see Shao. And Shao said, your wife is not happy. She cries because you are very poor. I can tell you what to do. Give your wife a broom and a dustpan. <clears throat> Say to her, sweep the house, sweep under the bed, sweep under the shelves, sweep carefully. Then Yah went home. He said to his wife, here is a broom. Here, uh, here is a dustpan. Sweep the house, sweep under the bed, sweep under the shelves, sweep carefully. So the king's daughter swept, and in the floor near the stove she saw a door. She opened it. She saw pots of gold and silver. Yeah, she said, come see, and she stopped crying. <laughs> she was happy. Later, Yah and his wife had a baby. The baby grew. One day, Yah's wife said, Dear Yah, our baby can sit now. I want to go visit my mother, father and mother. Please come with me and the baby. I think about my parents very much. So Yah took his wife and baby. He took the horse and the red-eyed dog, and they went to visit the king. Yah's wife said, my father will give us a gift. He will ask, what do you want? Don't ask for silver or gold. Ask for his round piece of iron, his dry gourd, and his piece of buffalo hide. Later, the king asked Yah and his wife, what do you want? And Yah said, only your round iron ring, your dry gourd, and your piece of buffalo hide. The king said, I don't want to give them to you. I am a king. I need these things. Then Yah's wife said, but father, you said go, and I went. I obeyed you. My sisters said no. I said yes. Give us the round piece of iron. Give us the dry gourd and the buffalo hide. Her father answered, you went with the red-eyed dog. You obeyed me. Take these things. So Yah and his wife and baby went home again. They took the piece of iron the dry gourd, and the buffalo hide. They put these things in their house, and a big, beautiful house came. Servants and rice fields came every year all their life. Our helpful contextual notes from six Hmong folk tales retold in English explain that for the Hmong in Laos, Horses were laboring and hauling animals and also used for riding, but they were not used for plowing or cultivating land. Regarding dogs, we're told that the traditional Hmong of Laos often had dogs in their villages, but did not consider them particularly like, likable or intelligent. Dogs were generally not fed, but scavenged and roam, and children played with them. According to old beliefs, evil spirits avoided them because dogs could see spirits in the night. On horses, the authors explain that a horse is believed to transport the soul of the deceased to its new home in the realm of the dead, and thus are associated, associated with death and burials. Regarding the orphan theme, this book explains that the orphan, usually male, typically rises from poverty to great wealth, often with the help of a wise and good woman and magic power. And in this case, I add a dog. Since Hmong families are very closely knit and orphan children are cared for and adopted by uncles and aunts or other relatives, a child left without any relatives would be indeed a destitute and desperate person. 
Another title included in the Refugees Study Center Library, and our last tale today, is Owl and the Deer, which was produced by Minneapolis Public Schools in 1994 alongside a tale called My and the Wicked Witch. We see the many contributors listed here. This book is bilingual, and Zhang Li kindly recorded a few pages read in Hmong. This story is yet another explanatory one and full of talking animals, this time without humans. And we'll see if I can, okay, good. <clears throat> An owl invites a deer to join eating the fruits of the forest. Problems soon follow, however, because the deer is frightened when the owl opened his big eyes very wide. The deer runs away, and what ensues is one misadventure after another, each one causing the next, and it's very long, so I'm summarizing here. The deer trips on a pumpkin vine, which causes the pumpkin to roll and crash into a tree, which causes next the seeds of the tree to fall down and blind a chicken. The blind chicken steps on ants and angers them, and so on, and so on. A peacock finally gets involved and seeks to understand what has happened by finally going back to the owl. The story resolves in the final pages. Oh, So, um, where am I? So, the peacock says, right? Why did you open your eyes so wide? You scared the deer. The owl did not know what to say. The peacock got very upset and twisted the owl's neck. And that is why owls can turn their heads all around. Zhang shared with me that traditional Hmong stories do not end with the phrase, the end, which is why it is not seen on the left-hand side, left-hand page. So in that spirit, I won't end my talk saying the end, but rather a thank you, and I hope to see you in the archives soon. All right, our second presentation is What We Learned from Animals by Eric Moore, university archivist and co-director of the University Digital Conservancy. From objects of study to animal-assisted therapy, animals are part of the University of Minnesota and its history. Good afternoon. I'm Eric Moore. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Eric Moore. I'm head of the University of Minnesota Archives. And today we're going to take a look at a few of the different types of relationships people have with animals on campus and through time uh, and ask the question, what is it we learn from animals? I think it's safe to say 
uh, that these students are learning nothing from this cat equation. <laughs> but with a little more effort, they might learn that in 2012, the American Veterinary Medical Association estimated that in the United States, 36% of all households owned at least one dog for a total of 43 million dogs. Uh, and that 30% of all households owned at least one cat uh, for a total of 36 million cats. Full disclosure, uh, I have five pets. <laughs> Two cats and three dogs. I am well above the average. Of course, this is likely one image that you might associate with learning from animals in a research university. However, this is not the focus for today. A little archival evidence shows us that our faculty and staff have cared for and embraced animals in the most personal ways. This is Dean Elias Lyon of the medical school with Nellie Eastman Lyon and Bino. This is about the only animal whose name I discovered in all of today. Millie Haig, who is an office assistant in the Department of Animal Husbandry. This is about circa 1954. The artist, Malcolm Myers, uh, who is also chair of the Studio Arts Program, if you look closely, there's a white rabbit uh, up against his shirt. President Morrow, in a boat, with a dog and a young boy. Uh, the dog is hardly decipherable. There were a couple different photos, and in none of them could you actually really see the dog, only the silhouette. <laughs> and poor Dean Freeman of the College of Agriculture in a precarious position, uh, not quite sure how the moment is about to turn. <laughs> We see it every day in our news cycle, why our dogs and cats are good for us and make our lives healthier and more productive. The origin for most of these types of studies, research endeavors, and popular news articles actually have a close tie with the University of Minnesota and a decision made over 40 years ago to take a serious look at the health and economic impact of companion animals in our day-to-day -day lives. The Center to Study Human-Animal Relationships and Environments, or more easily, SunShare, was established in 1981 as a joint program between the College of Veterinary Medicine and the School of Public Health. You see here uh, various uh, web uh, snapshots of the history of its website, uh, which is uh, available through the university archives. Its original purpose was to study the impact of human-animal relationships on the health, quality of life, and economics. Today, Century's mission is to study and quantify the connections between animal and human health, both from the human and from the animal perspective. The mission has shifted from a qualitative approach to a quantitative approach, as the health sciences have become evidence-based. This collection was brought to the University Archives in 2007. It's one of the original collections that I, I had a chance to work with when I first began working with the University Archives. And I had a chance at that point in 2007 to meet with several of the original founding members of SendShare, who unfortunately are no longer with us today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them next. And unfortunately, I have no good pictures of any of them. So uh, uh, you'll have to bear with me. Dr. Robert Anderson, or RK as he was known, was a founding member of SenShare, along with Professor Stanley Deesh of the Veterinary uh, College, and Ruth Foster, community animal behavioral specialist. 
Except for the first year of Sunshare, chair, Dr. Anderson served as director for 28 years prior to coming to Minnesota in 1956 to serve as a professor at veterinary bacteriology and public health, Anderson worked with the Denver Department of Public Health where he helped to legislate the first leash laws in Denver in the 1950s. Uh, he noted in an oral history that people were just used to their dogs running free, so the idea of putting them on leashes was not uncontroversial. And he oversaw a citywide rabies vaccination program. Ruth Foster served as a connection between the university and a community of individuals focused on animal welfare and education. While not a member of the University of Minnesota faculty, sorry, uh, Foster served as a board member for SunShare and took an active role in directing and participating in the research supported by the center. Most notably of that research, Foster and Anderson sought for a different means by which people controlled their animals, specifically dogs. They saw collars and leashes as a source of negative feedback for a dog and a source of physical discomfort and potential harm. But how to control and direct a dog without a collar? Foster and Anderson looked at the use of bridles used by farm animals and in 1985 patented a design for a combination collar and muzzle used as a humane method of restraining, controlling, and achieving obedient behavior in animals, dogs in particular, or what many of us today know as the gentle leader. Actually, I do have a picture of Anderson, but I had to save it for this one. The gentle leader was more than just a new way to walk your dog. It was identified by the Smithsonian as one of the 100 best inventions of the 20th century. It was also a financial lifeline to send chair, which had no regular budget line. The patent provided a 20-year protection on the design, allowing for its commercialization. Profits from the product served as the primary revenue stream for the center and had primarily that had primarily depended on grant funds and donations. In addition to the gentle leader, SendShare maintained a broad portfolio of research activities that drew in faculty from all areas of the university who overlapped with their mission of human-animal relationships. In 1983, SendShare hosted a national conference on human-animal bond resulting in the publication the Pet Connection. The publication boasts dozens of chapters that are foundational in the ways we think and talk about pet therapy today, including ways that are so ubiquitous you might not even know there's a science behind it. For example, why does your dentist office have an aquarium? Because the research shows contemplation uh, of an aquarium, like meditation and biofeedback, can reduce blood pressure and heart rate in both hypersensitive and normal subjects. It also introduced many chapters to the rehabilitative role of horseback riding that can have for children with language and communication disorders, and also presented the way dolphins could elicit communication from non-communicative children with autism. In 1986, Shinchair, Senchair developed the first university level course in the United States on the human-animal bond perspectives of interrelationships of people and animals in society. The course focused on health consequences of our relationships with animals, including opposing viewpoints. It also provided what was then a new understanding of the mental well-being of both animals and humans. Note that the course was also available through live television as a way to connect two campuses, St. Paul and a classroom in Rochester. Senchair took advantage of that closed circuit television technology throughout the 80s and delivered over 39 courses in this format. In addition to live television, Senchair developed a video series called the Companion Animals in Healthcare Centers and it provided information on developing pet programs in nursing homes and care facilities including instructional materials for the safe introduction of a pet program. 
This series was also based on research Sunshare and others were doing at the time, including looking at the mental and health well-being of aging individuals and animals. Sunshare worked on pub public policy issues and legislative initiatives for urban horses and carriage guidelines, state legislation for dog identification, and again, more rabies vaccination programs. Sunshare developed pet loss support groups and a program, Helping Paws, which was a volunteer program to train and prepare dogs to achieve, to act as service animals. The dogs would first live with volunteer homes and would be socialized and taught helpful tasks like picking up items dropped on the floor. Anderson and veterinarian Joe Quigley began work developing an inventory profile of feelings, beliefs, and knowledge concerning the rights of animals, people, and plants. Participants answered questions such as those on the screen, as well as, is it a violation of an animal's right for a coyote to injure or kill a rabbit? Is it a violation of an animal's right for a person to kill and eat a rabbit? Is it a violation for a spider to trap an insect in a sticky web? Is it a violation for a person to trap an insect in a sticky strip? Is it a violation to practice surgery on a dog to save a person's life? Or to infect a chimpanzee with an infectious agent for research? Is it a violation of an animal's rights to order the euthanasia of a terminally ill cat? Is it a violation to order the euthanasia of a healthy dog? It is not clear from the sample in this collection if they were able to survey enough people to draw conclusions. However, the questions remain thought-provoking and ethically challenging. Linda Ellis, a faculty member in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, had an interest in computational biology and informatics. Ellis, in the 1980s, was the director of the Health Information Systems Instruction uh, within the Division of Health Computer Sciences. Ellis sought to incorporate the computer as a teaching tool for humans to apply lessons to dogs. Ellis designed a computer program that would teach a pet owner how to train their animals. These early wireframes walk you through the game's interactive progress. Perhaps quaint by today's standards, but this is ultimately the same process by which apps are developed for our phones today. You can score yourself on this as well. <laughs> In 1988, SunShare began sponsoring a photo contest to demonstrate the human-animal bond. And here are a few submissions. And while we look at these, let's see if it's supposed to advance on its own. It's not. While we look at these, let's go back to our question. So what do we learn from animals? After spending time with the archival materials, my takeaway is that when we spend time with animals, we actually learn a lot about ourselves. <laughs> Who we are and what it means to be humane. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen and Eric. I think we have a couple of uh, minutes for a couple of questions for our presenters. Does anyone have a question? Yes, right here in the center.
So a question about how would a researcher find animals in the collection? You brought it up. You ask your friendly archivist. <laughs> it's always the best answer for um, pathways into the collections. Um, no, uh, there are some methods I can think of is to do some keyword searching in the language that we surround all this material with, in which we will make mention of, I'm sure, things like in your guide it speaks to animal rights and animal c care and those types of related terms. So you could definitely find those easily. Um, <clears throat> but it's been noted that very, um, up until maybe even this time frame, we as catalogers, describers, um, folks who work with this material every, every day have not been very conscious about applying tags um, and terms for material that might inform on animals, non-human animals, and the bond between humans and animals. So while I didn't do a thorough study of LC call uh, subject headings, so I'm not sure if there's one on human animal bond, I did search within our own material for that and didn't find any. So I think we're in, um, just as with many areas of our consciousness raising about how we describe our materials and the languages we choose to use and the access points that we do choose to create or not. Um, we're, we're beginning as a field to look at this in order to both respond and potentially lead to academic and popular interest in it. So I hope that answered your question. Eric, do you have things to add? All right, and maybe time for one more. Yes, a hand right here. I wonder if Eric has anything in the archive about the year that one of the artists, one of the art teachers in the art building wanted the students to draw a cow. So he had the cow brought over from the St. Paul campus. <laughs> <laughs> it made a huge mess, especially in his office. So from there on, he decided to take the students a, a question about importing a cow from the St. Paul campus to the art department. Uh, I, I have no pictures of that, um, to my knowledge. Uh, I'd be curious which faculty member it was, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there are always good, uh, good stories and good leads to look into things. Uh, for example, I had no pictures of Malcolm Myers uh, with his pet squirrel that he had for a while as well. But I did get to learn about that through his uh, widow. Uh, she referred to him as a squirrel nut. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you coming. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we can have a tour in the back with Tim in just a moment. And also an invitation to see our current exhibits Rapunzel Peanuts and Thousand Year Eggs, which is on foodways, very interesting. It's on the ground floor in the Wallen Center in the Bell Gallery, so I encourage you to take a look at that. And also an exhibit titled Unity Without Uniformity that celebrates the communities of new Americans who have shaped Minnesota and the International Institute of Minnesota. And for that one, you can take the stairs or the elevators to the upper galleries. Uh, and please, Join us again on December 6th for Just a Dog, presented by Kate Dietrich, archivist of the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, and The Hound Underground, presented by Tim Johnson, curator of the Sherlock Holmes Collection. Thank you.